Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, it's a bonus webinar session at the end of our Design Timber series of webinars for 2024. Uh, my name is Matt Milton. I am Editorial and Publications Director here at Timber Development UK. So just while we're waiting for everybody to join, I'm going to very, very rapidly say a few words about Timber Development UK, in case you don't know about us. Um, we're a relatively new organisation, but we're also quite an old historic one in that we formed in 2021 from the merger of the TTF, Timber Trade Federation, and TRADA, the Timber Research and Development Association. Um, we have three main missions to connect the supply chain, to lead best practice, and to accelerate a low carbon future. And we carry out those missions with events like this one, and with all our many other outputs. You can see a few of them there. One is Designing Timber, that's our our beautifully designed um, quarterly magazine, which showcases all the best in timber design. You can see next to it one of our many case studies. That one is on Durley Chine Environmental Hub, a great sustainable project. Um, if you go to our website, you'll find many more of those case studies, which we've just made open and accessible to everybody. You don't have to be a member to browse our case studies library. Uh, beneath that, you can see one of our many timber knowledge sheets, um, we, we publish a lot of these. They uh, provide an introduction to pretty much anything and everything connected to timber construction. And next to that, you can see uh, another recent publication of ours on timber policy, which uh, demonstrates what countries across the world are doing to accelerate timber construction. Uh, actually, this is a little excerpt from the um, knowledge sheet I just showed you on uh, embodied carbon data for timber products. Um, if you were to open that one, for example, you'd see, you know, all the embodied carbon data for uh, common timber products. Um, here's a quick selection of those timber knowledge sheets you can find on our site. Uh, timber typologies, another great one of our publications. It's just a quick introduction to all the difficult, the different timber construction methods and materials. And here, very relevant to this particular webinar, some of the fire related timber knowledge sheets you can find on our site. Um, and talking of which, um, I'd encourage you all to visit the website timberfiresafety.org. That's a joint venture between us, Timber Development UK, and the Structural Timber Association and Swedish Wood. So that's a dedicated site to timber and fire safety. Um, it's geared to all knowledge bases, so you can kind of pick your own path through the many pages on that website, depending on um, your own level of technical expertise. Um, if you're a developer, for instance, um, you might want to look at certain pages. If you're an engineer, you might want to go a bit more technical. Um, but yes, I do urge uh, any of you who are interested in timber and fire safety, as I'm sure you're, you all are because you're at this webinar, do visit that site. It's an extremely valuable resource. A um, couple of other um, useful publications you'll find on our site. Um, so I'll give you the, the flip side to uh, fire safety. Moisture management during timber construction is a uh, recent publication of ours um, addressing another um, challenge in uh, timber construction. Um, we do hope that if you're not a member, you'll consider joining us. Um, there's uh, lots of information on how to join on our website. And um, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to the first of our speakers now, um, Alastair Crossley, who is uh, Associate Fire Engineer at uh, the Fire Surgery. So Alastair, if you want to take over um, and share your screen. Law is yours. Um. I can see that. Right. Hopefully that's come through. Thank you for confirming, Matt. Um, okay. Um, so Welcome to the first part of the today's webinar. Um, so yes, my name is Alistair Crossley. I'm uh, an associate fire engineer with the fire surgery. Um, I'll be running through the first part of the presentation where I'll be giving a, a kind of overview of the, um, the fire safety and timber in the UK um, and the kind of processes that we've um, developed for designing for fire safety with 
for a timber building um, within the fire surgery in partnership with Ignis. Um, after my section, Ignis will present a section um, and they will get into some of the more the technical detail around sort of calculations and detailing. Um, so um, let me, so just to start with a little bit about the fire surgery. Um, we're a fire engineering consultancy um, of 15 people and we're based in the city of London. Um, despite being relatively small um, fire engineering consultancy, we do um, specialise in de designing unique fire strategies and always have done um, since the very beginning of the company. Um, one of the, the, the company's first ever project was the Sam Wanamaker Theatre, which um, won a, a Best Fire Strategy Award from the SF back in 2015 which was interestingly enough a, a full timber building <laughs> um, it was a recreation of a, of a, a Jacobean theatre with everything as, as untreated timber so we've um, yeah it's quite quite appropriate that we're we're now um, working with a lot of timber in in new in a very different type of building to that um, we've continued winning Best Fire Strategy of the Year awards from the SFP in other years, as you can see there for some interesting projects, Croom Court and the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and we also were awarded um, Engineering Talent Awards Small Medium Enterprise of the Year back in 2020. Um, and you can see uh, some pictures of some of our uh, more interesting, more famous projects on the screen there. Um, so the first... So to, to start this presentation on mass timber and CLT, the, the first question to, the first thing you've really got to understand when you're looking at fire safety is why is our standard guidance not applicable? Why can we not just pick up approved document B, BS9999 and other similar documents and design the building and make it out of timber? Why, um, and the, the reason that you can't is the the underlying assumptions to some of those documents um, essentially assume that your um, the structure of the building is non-combustible. By using combustible structure, which obviously you're doing with mass timber, you're going to change the fire dynamics in the building and you're going to change how the building behaves and responds in the event of a fire. And therefore, all the, all the assumptions that underpin those guidance documents might not hold true anymore which is why um, you can't just follow the standard um, standard guidance documents. So the next, uh, next you have to look at what guidance there is available. There's lots of guidance available from the insurance industry, um, but the, the guidance that probably best addresses some of the issues when it comes to um, fire safety design from a life safety point of view is the Structural Timber Association um, guidance document. Um, volume six, mass timber structures, building regulation compliance, uh, B3 part one. So it's important to point out there that really this this STA document is aimed at um, B3, the structure of the building. It doesn't address other elements of the fire strategy, which you do have to give due consideration to when you're designing um, uh, fire strategy for a mass timber building. Um, so, Within the, within the STA guide, it sets out, one of the most useful things it does is it sets out um, a permissible compliance route. And it offers you different routes depending on the consequence class and the height of the building. So for lower consequence class, lower height buildings, you can follow a kind of guidance-based approach. By guidance-based, that would mean you could follow, um, say, approved document B or BS9999, and then maybe the Eurocode design or standard information from um, suppliers about the fire resistance of the materials, and you don't have to go beyond that. Um, if you've got a higher consequence class or a higher height to the building, the, the heights come from fire service intervention heights, depending on building type. What the guidance is then recommending is that you follow um, a performance-based approach, which um, you'll see um, that you probably can't read it in full there, but note four um, 
for, which is the note against performance base, basically describes what that means. And it's, uh, it says demonstration by a competent structural slash fire engineer with relevant experience that the structure has a reasonable likelihood of surviving burnout with due consideration of the ability of automatic suppression systems to mitigate fire growth, the impact of the combusting structure on fire development, the ability of the structure to undergo self-extinction and the ability of the structure to support the applied loads during and beyond the fire event. Um, so essentially what what you're trying to prove there is that if you have a fire in a performance-based um, mass timber building, in, a, in one that you've designed to a performance-based fire strategy, that that fire, once it's burnt, or what we call the movable fire load in the, in the compartment that the fire's in, will die down, burn out, the exposed timber will stop charring and will eventually um, auto -extingu ex extinguish um, and that the remaining undamaged timber is of sufficient um, thickness to still take the structural load that is supporting so that the structure remains standing post the fire event and you don't get collapse of the building. Um, the, this approach is, is again summed up in this diagram um, where you essentially, again, for, sm for small low risk buildings where people can get out quickly and where fire um, brigade intervention is external or through limited internal um, travel, you can go down a guidance based approach. Um, and it explains there that that means a fully, ex fully exposed, partial protected or encapsulated with the assembly achieving the relevant fire resistance period recommended in standard guidance using codified calculation procedures, e.g. EN uh, 1995 part one, part two. If you've got a larger building where the evacuation is going to take a longer time or fire brigade intervention involves um, committing much more into the building with longer distances or traveling up greater heights and firefighting shafts, then you have to undergo this um, performance-based design where it says the structure is either prevented from contributing as a source of fuel through full encapsulation adequate to prevent pyrolysis for the full duration of the design, um, or um, self-extinction must be demonstrated with, so that's if you want to have your timber exposed, you have to demonstrate self-extinction -extingu um, with the structure capable of supporting the applied load during and beyond the fire. So two approaches. Um, we're going to talk much more about the performance-based design moving forward in this presentation because the that's, that's where the interesting engineering is. That's where the harder challenges are. So the... The first option available to you in a higher consequence class, higher height building is an encapsulation approach, which on the face of it sounds quite straightforward, but actually needs a, a more work than, than might be realized at first. The key requirement is that to for a, a boarding product to truly to, to properly encapsulate timber it has to be able to demonstrate that the non-exposed sides the timber side will stay below 200 degrees c and that has to come from the products test data so you can't just choose any kind of fireboarding product you have to choose one that can specifically demonstrate that performance criteria um, the next point is detailing of connections and penetrations requires careful consideration so you start with the timber structure you encapsulate it, and then you're going to need, you're most likely going to need to attach things to that structure. And now you've got penetrations to your encapsulation. So you have to look at that with a lot of careful consideration to see that you've actually, you're not stripping away that encapsulation protection. And then there is a, moving away from the, the fire design, there's, um, you know, does encapsulation negate the benefits of mass timber? So, depending on the project and the, the drivers behind it, if the appearance of uh, mass timber is an important driver, then obviously encapsulation, you don't get that benefit. Um, while overall, with encapsulation, you're still likely to get a, an improvement in the carbon assessment of a building, encapsulation products themselves take away some of the benefit. So 
there are you know if you can have if you can support exposed timber your carbon um the, the carbon assessment for the building is likely to be improved um so we'll give um give a first sort of example of a project that um, the fire surgeon Ignis have worked on together, which is um, the is project called 55 Pall Mall. Um, so a feasibility study was undertaken um, between the fire surgery and Ignis to explore the options for a hybrid CLT structure. And it started off with the aim that we wanted exposed um, mass timber in the building. Um, but unfortunately for this specific building it wasn't possible to achieve that um, to have exposed CLT slabs because we had deep floor plates a lack of sprinkler protection due to the sort of um, due to the site constraints and some of the existing conditions sprinkler protection was going to be difficult to introduce there were also um, party wall conditions which gave us a very deep floor plate with windows I think on only one of the four elevations and that that produced conditions where you get, because there's a limited um, openings, you um, get a ventilation controlled fire, which is a slower, longer burning fire and is actually worse for the design of the CLT. Um, and you would end up not being able to demonstrate um, auto extinction of the CLT. And therefore, we were able to early on establish that we weren't going to be able to support exposed CLT on this project. And encapsulation was the route forward. And the encapsulation was adopted using two times um, 18 mil thermocell boards. Um, and that project is currently on site um, halfway through uh, Reba Stage 5 with um, red construction. Um, so if we move on to exposed timber, um, You've probably noticed the, already in this presentation that there's sort of some interchangeable terms that the industry hasn't quite got an agreed um, word for. You might hear auto extinction, self extinction, burnout calculations. Sometimes instead of extinction, you get ex extinguishment. When people use these phrases, they they are normally meaning the same thing, um, and it is essentially when you have exposed timber, demonstrating as I explained earlier the fire in a compartment, once it's burnt itself out, the CLT will stop charring on its own without any intervention from the, the fire service or anything like that. And that the the char layer will have, um, the char layer will have su su sufficiently protected the, the rest of the timber structure, the uncharred elements, that the uncharred elements are still thick enough and strong enough to take the the load of the structure so that you don't get structural cl collapse at any point during the fire or post fire now that is a they're not straightforward calculations and um, most fire engineers including the fire surgery cannot undertake those calculations that's where we team up with ignis because they can undertake those calculations to deliver an exposed um, timber project you you need competency across the whole team and that's not just on the fire safety side not just the fire engineer and a company you know and, and somebody undertaking the role that ignis are under, undertake with us it's the architect do they have any experience of, of working with mass timber do they understand what's going to be required from the detailing side the structural engineer do they have experience the building control body and the building control body are likely to need a third party reviewer. Does this third party reviewer have um, competency? And does the client have any experience of mass timber? Do they understand what, what taking on a mass timber project means? And you need to, you really need to make sure that you've got competency across the team to deliver it, to deliver a mass timber project. Um, auto extinction, that's the first step. The other really important thing is the detailing, and that requires a lot of careful consideration. Um, and it's quite often it's the connection details between timber and other products, whether it's say quite often you have a steel frame supporting mass timber. Um, you and there's there's limited um, experience across the industry of of, de of of detailing for the for mass timber buildings. So you need to make sure you get that right. Um, and um, Ignis will talk later a lot more about how we um, deal with detailing on our projects. Um, and 
okay, this this I've should have changed this. This is a, a, what, I've put LFB consultation there. It should really be fun, fire brigade consultation. Fire brigade consultation wherever you are in, in the country is going to be very important on a mass timber building. Um, just to give you a quick example of a mass timber building that we've we've worked on, it's an independent school, um, which actually had a, a variety of conditions in it so that we had some exposed CLT, um, some rooms um, had exposed slabs, some exposed wall and some high risk rooms um, we had to encapsulate due to um, some of the activities. That was a school building that had some quite um, interesting activities in some of the rooms that were a higher fire risk and um, therefore encapsulation was relevant. Um, the next few slides I'm going to go through just in very high level just it's more just to give you an idea of what you have to think about as you work through the reba stages and the you know and, and it, this is really aimed at sort of architects design teams to make sure that you're, you're clear of what sort of activities you're likely to under, need to undertake during a um a sort of exposed timber project this is really aimed at but you would need to do similar things possibly for an encapsulated project as well. Um, so it's really a kind of roadmap through the stages. So you start probably really getting into the detail in Reba stage two. You may, if you know enough, be able to do some work early on in stage one, which can be very useful as well. Um, and you need to, you really need to be undertaking the qualitative design review process with the design team and including the building control body. Um, and it's at this point that you really want to get an initial auto extinguish extinction model completed um, just to really get those initial parameters set so that everybody understands what the constraints are to achieve auto extinction in the design. Um, and then you'd have the stage two fire strategy implications of CLT needed to be clearly demonstrated. As you move through the REBA stages, the number of um, Sort of actions to support the CLT design increases and it includes things like starting to meet with the fire brigade, meeting with insurers, um, starting to look at the details and make sure that you've got test evidence to support the details you want for the project. Um, and similarly as you go through stage four you're probably now looking to close out some of the some of the feedback you've had from the building control body, their third party reviewer, um as you've developed the details and you sometimes specific details you might need to introduce additional modeling for so for example finite element modeling might be required to support some of the details um and ignis will talk a lot more about that that sort of thing in their um in their part of the presentation and then it's also useful to have early engagement within with your clt contractor or your mass timber contractor um so that you start getting their input on the design. Um, and it carries on through construction. You need to make sure that the details, uh, that the contractor understands the details, the subcontractors understand it, and that the details if they've, as they've been designed can actually be built. Any development around that, you need to have tight controls on to make sure that you've still got um, robust details that you can demonstrate meet the performance requirements of the fire strategy. Um, and you have to, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to finish with a, a story of, of how the fire surgery and Ignis first got together. Um, it started with a project um, 36 to 38 Barclay Square, which the fire surgery were appointed to in Reba Stage 1 back in 2019. Mass Timber got introduced to the scheme in Reba Stage 2. Um, at that point, um, we, we at the fire surgery adopted um, a risk-based approach to look at the timber. At the start of Reba stage four, which was um, around about the autumn of 2020, there was a change in building control on the project to Sweco, who had more experience with mass timber. And the STA guide that I referred to earlier was published. At that point, it became clear that auto extinction calculations were gonna be necessary to support the design. Um, and we, at the fire surgery knew we were not competent to deliver those we couldn't complete that so we then we reached out to our contacts in the industry to to fill that um gap in competency and that through speaking to our contacts we were put in touch with ignis and we 
had a conversation with them and quickly realized that they were able to provide exactly what we were not able to provide on the project and between us we had we could um fulfill the competency requirements um so um just to give an overview of the project itself it was broadly co-compliant except for some minor deviations um in all aspects of its design except for the use of clt it was it's an office building um just under 30 meters in height it's got two firefighting shafts with a concrete basements and core with a steel frame um clt floor slabs and we followed a qdr process with ignis with building control um with the client and with all relevant parties and that really because of the, the timeline I explained earlier, that didn't start until stage four. On, fu on future projects, you would look to start that a lot earlier. Um, the auto extinction calculations were completed by Ignis, and some of the key results that came out of that is that we needed a CLT product that had glue line integrity and fire um, and top side protection so that we protect the, the top of the CLT slabs but left the underside exposed. There was an approvals process, um, SWECO building control and their third party review process to ensure that um, everything that was, you know, was fully reviewed um, and it was the back and forth to close out questions there. And there was um, very good involvement with the uh, London Fire Brigade. And a, a key thing they have on CLT buildings and, and any building they, they see with sort of higher risk is an alterations notice is, is something they've put on that project so that in the future, any changes that are made will have to properly consider the fact that it's a CLT structure. Um, the detailing was uh, a long process with many iterations, but in the end, we were able to reach um, uh, details for the project that were fully reviewed by Ignis, and, it, and we avoided the need for project-specific testing. Ignis were able to demonstrate through their own um, sort of database of test evidence that the details achieved what we needed them to do. The project is now in stage five and is very close uh, to PC. Um, that project was our first project with Ignis. And since that started in autumn 2020, and since then we've developed that relationship to the point that the fire surgery or Ignis's preferred UK fire engineering consultancy partner. We've successfully worked together on over 20 projects. We've contributed to funding of Ignis fire testing. There's a picture in the bottom left that you can see there of some members of Ignis and the fire surgery at a test rig. Um, and the fire surgery also completed a, a, a full company visit to Zurich to meet Ignis and see their lab at the University of Zurich, which is you can see in the second picture there. So um, that, was, that was my section. Um, I'll hand over to Joachim Schmidt from Ignis. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly point out to everybody that um, there's a QA and a box. Um, many of you have been asking questions and I'm sure I don't need to in encourage you to ask this. There's, they're flooding in, but um, do use that Q&A box. And also you might want to just notice that there's one, there's a grayed out box called Answered. So if you click on Answered, you can kind of see lots of questions that our, our panel have been busy answering. So thank you. I'll hand back over to um, Joachim. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Matt, for the floor. I'm happy to present some further slides about uh, Barclay Square and the process behind the um, verification and analysis we took. Much more than uh, I can present in the next 20 minutes, but I will give you a, a short overview. And if you're interested, of course, uh, there will be opportunities uh, where we share much more and even in deeper uh, levels, I would say. So who we are. So my name is Joachim Schmidt. I'm a founder, co-founder of a quite small company as well. We are currently 10 members, um, structural engineers and designers. Um, we met, we are research fellows. We met uh, in research projects and realized that there, is a pro there are several problems with a timber design, and one is uh, the competency development, but also the transfer to practice. 
And that's where we started to answer questions to practitioners and finally founded Ignis to have, a, let's say, a, a tool to do this. Um, most of us are structural engineers. We did uh, PhDs in fire safety engineering and we still uh, supervise uh, masterworks and PhDs as we are affiliated with universities in Switzerland, Germany and Estonia. We have uh, now expanded globally, I would say, in terms of uh, projects, but we are as employees uh, based in Europe with our partner uh, in London, the fire surgery. We are still active in research. We uh, invest a certain share of our turnover into research and development projects, and we uh, assist in UK projects, in steering committees, as reviewer, but we are also active in standardization because what we want is dissemination. And uh, all of our models, more or less, that we develop, for example, with Eurocode 5, fire part, uh, have been developed in some uh, research projects. And uh, to some extent, these models will assist in the future the design of buildings and timber buildings in Europe. Uh, our experience comes uh, from testing and modeling these tests. And these tests are a large range of, let's say, uh, tests that we cover with that. We cover uh, fire resistance tests in furnaces, as you see on the very left. We do detail tests, connections, uh, even finger joints, product tests, adhesive tests, timber frame, very traditional, but also um, compartment tests where one of these first compartment tests were uh, um, executed at ETH in Zurich uh, in the year 2019, uh, comparing combustible and non-combustible environments. Yeah, and uh, all of this experience gave us the chance also to draft and disseminate handbooks, uh, guidelines, both to industry, uh, insurances, designers, practitioners, uh, and uh, last but not least, also reviewers and building authorities, which should uh, expand their uh, competency in uh, timber and fire engineering. That's a big lack and we are working on improving that as well. So continuing now what Alistair started, a journey about Barclay Square, but more in general about how CLT and mass timber design can work. I want to conclude now with the performance-based design, the section four here where I give some examples. And I want to address the background of the fire resistance framework that we have and everybody assumes as, let's say, baseline. I want to give you some insights about auto extinguishment, what it is, what it cannot be, and how to see its limitations. And I want to show you that auto extinguishment by itself does not work alone you need to have a competency also at the very end to design the, these details, connections, joints, but also choose products and um, all members as uh, you should, because that should be in line with this modeling that somebody needs to do. So I want to continue with what is our framework. So our framework of fire safety engineering is not, let's say, given, it was and is under development. It is kind of a reflection of building tradition, bad experience and good practice. And it should satisfy, and it does, satisfy an accepted risk level. Nobody has really uh, defined in numbers what that is, but people learned what they want, what they do not want, and what works, and what is, let's say, unfavorable. And it says, when you follow building regulations and design guidance, you would achieve this reference building associated risk. Now, if we would introduce, introduce structural timber to a large extent, or a structural timber building, 
for a standard design house, you would increase the risk. And that is not acceptable. And to compensate these risks, you need to introduce countermeasures. Countermeasures, we can call, uh, call that uh, additional or new measures in the future that might be uh, standard measures again, because uh, standardization as standard guidance will advance. But these are needed to address these uncertainties that uh, some of you mentioned already in the chat or is uh, read about, and we can call them hazards. Hazards, I want to continue with what is it and how to address that. Not necessarily we need to talk about fire safety, but in general, a hazard appears uh, when you go by car from A to B, or, and that's where we took this so-called Swiss cheese model from, from the aviation industry. The aviation industry is, I would say, on the front line. They want to avoid problems before they exist, before they appear. And to visualize how a safety framework could work, they said, we want to show people that no safety level is 100% bulletproof, but if we introduce a lot of these layers, the arrow to the left side, the hazard, has no chance to go to the very right and create a damage. And that could be a property loss or a life loss uh, when it comes to this consideration. The goal could be also business continuity. Uh, maybe not so much uh, when we talk about uh, building regulations and life safety, but aviation industry and insurance industry is very interested in that. When we talk now about fire, we can give these layers names. It starts to the very left with something that more, maybe people forget, and that is common sense. If a candle will fall from the table next to me, I will take care of it. I will pick it up and will prevent that the curtain will catch fire. On the very right, you see structural resistance. That is very often addressed when people talk about fire safety. We want to make sure that the structure holds X amount of minutes, but there is many layers in between. And the most, let's say, known layers here are fire detection and sprinkler system, the yellow one here. Um, now I want to present and add to these layers also auto extinguishment analysis together with smart detailing. That's a term that we call, we at Ignis call our way of uh, detailing and deriving and developing these details. Both work hand in hand together. You cannot only work with one uh, because they need each other. And with these two elements, we want to bring the, let's say, combustible environment to a level of uh, traditional safety expectations. So with that, I want to, uh, let's say, introduce uh, some measures that we and, and processes that we implemented at Barclay Square to build the steel timber concrete hybrid. And as you see, I mentioned more or less all major building materials. I am quite convinced that no building will, a pure, will be a pure timber building in the future as these building materials uh, have all their advantages and we should be really wise in exploiting and using these materials with their, let's say, best capabilities. Auto extinguishment, verification of and how it works. So if you read, and I can really recommend reading it once, twice, or even three times, if you read the STA guidance that Alistair referred to, uh, you will find this graph. It's one of the most important ones, I would say. You find the heat release rate for an inert structure. That is the uh, greenish dotted uh, line on the, the lowest line. And it is, it is the heat release rate that we would expect 
in a conventional, traditional, non-combustible environment. You can translate that more or less even to a temperature time curve. In the beginning, you have a growth, you will find a steady state phase and then a decay. When you add too much timber to the building, and that would be then finally the upper curve, the continuous one, the fire will go on and go on. It will not self-extinguish. And as a designer and fire engineer, I'm now asked to achieve this purple line uh, to advise the team on how to do uh, the design properly to get a decay phase and finally a self-extinguishment of the fire. It is self-evident that the fire will be longer than in the reference case because we added additional fuel, but it should not be, let's say, longer than uh, what the design team wants, what you can afford, or longer as long as the structure uh, will be the structural integrity, the last layer will be compromised, and finally you can expect collapse. How to do that? Uh, it is two functions. That's also our, let's say, core of our teaching um, or our design workshops. You have to create uh, the building and the details, that's number B, properly, but it is also a function of the product choice. You need to find the correct product. And that could be the CLT slab with the correct adhesive or the chips and plaster boards or fire protection boards with a proper verified um, characteristic and performance. Um, just to show you some differences in very simple graphs, um, when testing a reference case and non-combustible environment, you have a movable fire load that will only be, let's say, ignited and, and um, consumed when the sprinkler system is not working and you will finally have a, a fully developed fire in a very, let's say, a severe fire case. I would say that could happen in uh, 80 years uh, lifetime, once or in li or a lifetime of every building, and you will expect, a, let's say, a fully developed fire as you see it to the left with uh, external flaming. The external flaming increases significantly when you also have structural timber involved in the fire. And that is on the ceiling, on the walls, uh, maybe uh, even the fuel and beams that hold the structure. You should be careful. You cannot translate the timber on the walls to additional interior, additional sofas. That doesn't work because then the fire would be just longer, but not more intense. However, we want to achieve this curve down to uh, have auto extinguishment. And I can tell you, it's not that we can uh, state at the end, we change minor bits in the fire design. Sometimes you need to change the environment, compartmentation, the windows to achieve this auto extinguishment. Where did we learn that? Uh, we did in the last, I would say we, I, I refer to this society, we did a lot of fire tests in the last decades, maybe, maybe more than uh, exist for non-combustible um, compartments and materials. Tests were done in small scale, in big scale, in huge large scales with big openings to reflect the needs of open space offices or uh, dwellings, as you see it to the lower side. Tests were done with wood crypts, with real interior or with burners. And all of this ended up in models. And as the validation sets have limitation, also the models have and experience their limitation. So you need also to comply always with the model uncertainty and model limitations when you do these models, when you apply the models. I want to explain you now how a model works. Um, that is typically now the Eurocode model. 
that will be proposed for some cases, not all of them. The model starts, or let's say the idea, you have a certain fire, a star, it starts with ignition growth, steady state, fully developed burning phase and decay phase for a reference building. The reference building is a non-combustible, therefore it's gray, gray curve. If you now introduce timber in the structure, the fire dynamics will change. The fuel load will increase. How does the fuel load increase? Well, people did tests since the 1920s with timber, timber columns, and they realized it chars. And this char could be translated to an additional structural fuel load. And this structural fuel load increases the exposure level. That means the fire will be slightly hotter, but also longer. Due to this elongation of this duration, you get an increased charring depth. And this will again add the structural fuel, increase the exposure level and so on and so on. And if you process these looping iterations, you may end up um, at, for, at a stable solution, number seven here, uh, as final solution for your compartment or the environment you are investigating. Depending on the model, uh, we could say between 300, 200 or 100 degrees Celsius, you can experience self-extinguishment. Self-extinguishment, be careful, again, that is discussed in the model limitation, what it considers and how you have to deal with it afterwards. And that's now the second point I will discuss in my presentation. And I want also to highlight, we have now discussed the layer number red, the red layer, auto extinguishment, which works together with the layer green, the fire resistance. So we have a performance-based fire that now needs to be applied on a performance-based structural verification. You cannot easily transfer one fire, performance-based developed to a standard fire. That would cause some issues and some, uh, let's say, additional work, but uh, it should match. That means you could translate uh, uh, with a time equivalency one fire to 78 minutes, but then you need also a 78 minutes for the timber. However, in a performance-based design, you need also to verify not for the peak temperature, but also for the decay phase, the structural integrity. Which brings me to what could be the results of such a study. The study could result in a large variation of uh, boundary conditions. Maybe the design aspiration that the design team had from the beginning, exposed the ceiling, can easily be uh, fulfilled, but not all walls, including uh, structural timber members and the ceiling. Maybe, as seen to the very right here, uh, you need to encapsulate everything because the fire would be too long and you cannot afford to create a R195 minutes building. Maybe you need to modify, as here in the center given, the ventilation openings to meet the boundary conditions of your uh, auto extinguishment analysis. Everything here should be done, and that's what I want to transfer here to the group, in a very early stage for a, a first check. We call it a feasibility check. The result of the feasibility check could be this one. You define openings, you check different shares, and finally you get a range of charring depth, here the blue curve, as a function of opening percentage that could be a function of the facade area and at the same time you get also a time equivalency a standard fire time equivalency this is not needed for the timber or steel design but it is essentially required because you have also fire sealants shutters dampers that you need to purchase and uh, probably you understand that a fire shutter for 60 minutes is less expensive than for 90. And as soon as you pass the 60 minutes, 
you need to uh, get the more expensive and higher grade of the of these items multiplying it by eight stories and 100 rooms it can be expensive and that's why you should do this at a very early stage as a side result you get also the temperature profile in timber members the external heat release rate and by that the external flaming input so summarizing the first part with these new hazards you need additional and new measures that could be the auto extinction calculation or um, analysis a tight cooperation is essentially needed we saw that you need to tightly uh, work together. The structural engineer needs to understand what you are doing. If you heard about the zero strength layer, and we need to modify that to meet more or less all phases in the fire, and the structural en engineer doesn't know what to do with it, you have a problem. We created workshops. We did workshops with the team, but also with selected members to teach them and elevate the competency of the team. The feasibility I mentioned already before. Some last slides about smart detailing. As I said, smart detailing is important to meet the boundary conditions for auto extinction, the analysis and to achieve it. We heard also in the comments here what to do about smoldering, smoldering and glowing combustion, how to deal with re-radiation, surface flaming. Well, Standard requirements are well known. That is the bullet point number one here. REI, we know that. It exists and people can more or less deal with it. Then there is also now coming these requirements of bond line or glue line integrity, the um, performance of the adhesive for the layered cross laminated timber, auto extinguishment I discussed here as well. But then there is additional points encapsulation, smoldering, inaccessible charring, combination of critical temperatures, deformations in the fire situation, timber, steel especially, very sensitive, I will discuss that on the next slide, and external fire spread where you saw the different flaming characteristics, at least visually. Well, how to create now a safe environment and we said the objective is to create details and members that experience not a bulletproof but a similar risk as a non-combustible solution so we want to elevate the safety level of the details so we can deal with it in our framework which is based on tradition and here I want to emphasize one example that people and engineers forget very often. The critical temperature of timber. Well, what is that? That could be the charring temperature, the pyrolysis, 200 or 300 degrees, and the critical temperature of steel. That is, well, often not really known, but the structural engineer works with that. You need to ask them because it often it does not, uh, con it, it's not written in a fire strategy. The critical temperature is typically between five and 600. And now when you combine both materials, you support timber on steel, all properly designed, what would happen? Well, you get inaccessible charring. The fire brigade has no chance to extinguish and I would say even worse, you get deformations that are not under control because the char layer has no strength and you will have relative deflections, settlements. And if you have a bad, badly designed detail, it can push and push down fire boardings. It can harm the fire protection of the other member. So you need to combine that in one detail and you have to deal with that, uh, I'd say, inconsistency. To solve that, IGNIS started uh, some, a series of fire tests and we are also involved in uh, public research projects now where we are advising on how and what to answer. Because the 
situation is it's very popular in UK to combine steel with timber. Um, how does that work? In general, we have a guidance on how details should work. That's how, a, let's say, a structural designer thinks that would be a proper solution. That's probably coming from building physics. And we know fire test results. And in the center, you find the advanced simulation. So we combine both worlds to a third world where we help the designer to find the solution proper solution for the design of the project because every project has different let's say uh, uh, achievements to fulfill and uh, here you see on the left the results from fire testing loaded tests unloaded tests and on the right you have the design that we developed for Barclay Square where the details are designed in a way that they will not experience charring. We recommend already in Reba stage three, you need to identify principal details. So the details that uh, describe more or less 90% of all details in your building, that might not be more than three, but in Reba stage four, you need to solve all details. Don't leave it to the contractor. That would be an a big risk for the project and additional costs. Otherwise, you cannot get sign off if you cannot verify, let's say, the integrity of the detail, um, the tightness, eventually compartmentation, and so on and so on. Last but not least, should be, let's say, valid for all of our buildings. What you plan needs to be also built and somebody needs to control and check that. If you increase, if you have an increasing number of sub consultants and sub companies working for uh, the contractors, that is a risk. You need to have somebody having the control about quality management. With this slide, I want to say thank you. Uh, that was the uh, limited view. However, I hope it was already uh, giving you some answers about how extinguishment, auto extinguishment design and analysis could work. What does it give and what can it not do? It will not solve our problems entirely just by doing it. You need to have additional measures on the side. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, thank you to Alistair as well. Um, two fantastic presentations. Um, as you've probably noticed, we're, we're running very close to time, but I think we're going to uh, carry on and, and go over by about 10, 10 minutes or so. Um, I can see lots of questions have been asked um, and the panel have done an amazing job, I think answering a lot of them very specifically. So do have a look at the answered column and we'll try to We'll share all, all of those very specific I think, technical answers uh, with you all afterwards. Um, there were quite a few questions in there about, I think, the relationship between steel and timber. And, and Joachim, you just you just mentioned both in terms of um, in terms of in terms of their of limits and temperatures. But um, I just wanted to ask, uh, perhaps it's an ignorant, ignorant question, but I was wondering whether the how much the hybrid timber steel elements were a structural uh, decision or were informed by by fire concerns um, early in the in the project um, and, and and perhaps as well as that um, may, maybe some of you could could talk about um, the relationships between and considerations to bear in mind in in terms of fire and temperature when designing with both steel and timber if anybody who wants to pick up on that. I think I think normally it's um the it, it comes from the structural engineer as to what the 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 initial design intent is whether they want to build it a full mass timber building or whether they're looking for a steel frame and say CLT soffits certainly that's been our experience on most of the projects we've worked on together is that the, the architect and structural engineer have an idea of what they want and they present that to us to us and ask whether it's feasible rather than them starting 
with full mass timber and us saying, no, no, you have to turn some of it into steel or, or something like that. Right. And I saw, Michael, you you had answered uh, a question or two, I think, about, um, you know, relationships between steel and, and timber, you know, in terms of their proximity. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything more you, you'd like to say on that. Yeah, with, with pleasure. So it's it's always because I mean we are as a as a design team, you're always trying to get a kind of st a standardized handbook um, overview for to prepare your or to design your details, and that's always a that's something which which would be great to have. But I I think it's always from our experience, it's always a case by case topic. So you need to first understand. What do you have to achieve? So what are the fire resistance requirements? Joachim mentioned additional requirements like inaccessible charring, um, smoldering and glowing combustion elements, which are, let's say, typically important for, for timber. And once you have defined in the design team what you have to achieve, then you can design or detail um, or work work out the, the detail. Um, so it's a... It's a bit difficult to give a, a general, um, let's say, standard uh, element, um, and um, it would be great to have that in the future. Uh, but uh, I would say it's it's always important what to to first de um, define what you need to achieve, and then detail the detail as as you need to. Great, thank you. I'd I'd also seen a couple of questions on uh, glue line integrity. And, and and bond line integrity. Um, and I think one of the answers that somebody had given had suggested that the CLT supplier themselves carried out a test hmm. uh, to, to ensure that, that bond line integrity um, was good, um, which, which made, me, made me wonder, is that, are, should the CLT supplier be the person responsible for that? Is, is that the norm? Um, well, well, may I answer? So uh, we discussed this very much in the standardization uh, committees, and uh, indeed, it could be either the CLT uh, or the glue manufacturer. So um, at the end, it doesn't matter for us because we want just to build with it and somebody needs to take care of it. And it's not that you need to test for every new product. So uh, it means that at the end, uh, we experience that it is the CLT manufacturer in cooperation with the glue manufacturer or the adhesive manufacturer doing these tests. Uh, and there will be, I would say, soon a portfolio of products that are certified, that are not certified. You can, you, it's not necessarily needed for all projects. And you can, you can choose the port portfolio accordingly but it will be not for the project, uh, uh, let's say an additional uh, test to do, to run. I see. Um, I, I also noticed, uh, I think a positive comment about um, uh, London Fire Brigade's involvement. Um, I was just wondering at what point would you typically expect on a project to be involving the London, well, local fire brigade departments. Um, at what sort of stage? How early? Um, I mean, you, you've got to make that decision um, in conjunction with building control, because obviously the local fire brigade are, are a consultee to the building control body. Um, but you should be trying to get them involved as early as possible as as part of a full QDR process. They are, you know, one of the relevant stakeholders in the QDR process. So if you don't go to them until late in the process, you you won't get their input and or you you won't get their input in time to do anything with it in the design. So it is important to to consult with them early. Um, especially if if you're doing something new or unique or different to what you may have presented or worked through with them in the past. Great, thank you. And I, and I suppose following on from that, I was going to ask if there were, I mean, uh, Hakim, you um, showed a couple of take-homes and I was just wondering if you could kind of 
almost have a take home from the take homes if there was sort of any one abiding uh, pieces of advice you could give. I mean, I was wondering that we always hear the message of early involvement. Um, I mean, you sort of mentioned a feasibility study at Reba stage two. Um, if you wanted to put one sort of overarching message out there, would it be early engagement, ensuring that your that designers are thinking about um, about uh, fire safe design and all the things you've been talking about in this webinar at you know, as early a stage as possible, read stage one or two. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, there's there's probably two things. Uh, first, I, I think a fire engineer, although they are very busy typically, uh, all of them would be happy to be involved early because uh, it can really mess up uh, when the fire is the last thing that you have to think about and that you have to solve. That's the first thing. And the other would be quite a concrete one is when timber is not really visible, it doesn't make sense to expose it. Meaning on a below a raised access floor, it doesn't make sense to, to add it to the structural fuel because that will just create issues with additional fuel, uh, extinction, accessibility, and so on. So that would be probably my first, uh, let's say, uh, very concrete, um, advice to design teams. If it's not needed to uh, expose timber, don't do it. Great. Um, and I suppose I'll just ask everybody, I mean, we had lots of questions come in and, and thank you very much for answering them um, very thoroughly and, and, and rigorously. Um, in doing so, did did uh, anything come up that you, you, any of you would like to sort of share? A any particularly good questions that you'd, you'd like to um, respond to um, verbally? Well, well, may I? I mean, very short. There was a question about is uh, sprinkler uh, essentially required for uh, CLT? I would say uh, if you can verify the design without sprinkler, it's, it's fine, of course. Uh, it's just, uh, it's not very wise. I mean, I would say a sprinkler is like an airbag. Uh, it's kind of a safety measure you would not like to drop. And I think, Andy, you can experience or share your experiences. It is very often considered in discussions as a, a joker. Yeah, I mean, sprinklers is one of the first questions that normally gets asked when we're using mass timber on a project. Um, we like to use it in the context of a holistic fire strategy. So not just using it in isolation because of the use of timber and a combustible structure, but looking more widely at benefits for sprinklers like poor firefighting access, means of escape and, and, other, and other measures. But we often find that, you know, insurers generally insist on sprinklers. Um, and so we're quite happy to incorporate them on our projects. And, and obviously, like any system like that, if it's thought about early, then it's not that big a deal. It, it's when it's not thought about um, that it becomes a, a a much bigger issue to incorporate. Um, but yeah, we, we tend to, where, where we've got exposed CLT, um, and, and certainly a lot of it, we tend to favour uh, incorporation of, of sprinklers. And just to answer your question, Matt, um, a couple of questions I saw which were interesting is the, the external fire spread. I mean, there's lots of aspects of our design that need to be considered, not just the structural implication of using mass timber, um, but, you know, the, as we talked about firefighting access, um, we know from experience with a lot of fire brigades that they prefer to come into the building through concrete cores um, when we have um, a, a considerable amount of mass timber. And so that's important for us to think about early. Um, we have got situations where we've got mass timber and, and, and shaft wall design for our cores. Um, but, you know, moving to full mass timber firefighting cores is not something we've done just now. Um, external fire spread, as I say, is another uh, issue that we have to think about with exposed um, mass timber because the flame projection and, and the temperature of flames is, is way hotter than you would get with non-combustible structures. And if you're in close proximity to your boundary or adjacent buildings, then that's gonna have a, a, an implication. So I think the final thing I'll probably um, um, leave with everybody is that 
what I found is that the concepts generally are, are quite easy to establish early in the design of whether you can be exposed or encapsulated or whether it's a hybrid structure or, or full mass timber. Um, but a lot of our work, certainly with Ignis and the supply chain is in the details. Um, it's in the detail, the connection details with other members, um, you know, the, the, the hybrid systems, for example, uh, and, get, and getting those details correct, demonstrating, you know, a level, a high level of confidence that your CLT structure will still perform is, is, is what I've found to be probably the most challenging. Um, and that's something that you should start early in the design process. A lot of the time, those kind of things are left to the contractor in Reba stage five with the specialists. And that, in my mind, and from my experience, introduces a huge amount of risk to a project. Those details should be established really as, as early as possible, possibly Reba stage three, or definitely Reba stage four, so that you have confidence that that, that detail can actually be built. Great, thank you very much. Um, well, it's uh, 10 past two, so I think we should um, probably uh, wrap things up. So thanks again to our um, to our panelists and speakers. Um, that was an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation and great webinar. I'm just gonna leave you with information of an upcoming event. This is an in-person event, actually, rather than a webinar, uh, Managing Moisture in Mass Timber Construction on Tuesday, 12th of November, 2024, which we're, which we're sponsoring in London. But um, thanks again to our panelists um, and um, goodbye everybody and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.